Welcome back to my video series on Scikit-Learn for Machine Learning. In the previous video, we learned how to search for the optimal tuning parameters for a model using Scikit-Learn's grid search and randomized search tools. In this video, I'll be covering how to properly evaluate classification models. Here's the agenda. What is the purpose of model evaluation and what are some common evaluation procedures? What's the usage of classification accuracy? And what are its limitations? How does a confusion matrix describe the performance of a classifier? What metrics can be computed from a confusion matrix? How can you adjust classifier performance by changing the classification threshold? What is the purpose of an ROC curve? And how does AUC differ from classification accuracy? Let's briefly review the goal of model evaluation and the evaluation procedures we have learned so far. Model evaluation answers the question, how do I choose between different models? Regardless of whether you are choosing between k-nearest neighbors and logistic regression, or selecting the optimal tuning parameters, or choosing between different sets of features, you need a model evaluation procedure to help you estimate how well a model will generalize to out-of-sample data. However, you also need an evaluation metric to pair with your procedure so that you can quantify model performance. We've talked in depth about different model evaluation procedures, starting with training and testing on the same data, then train-test split, and finally k-fold cross-validation. Training and testing on the same data is a classic cause of overfitting in which you build an overly complex model that won't generalize to new data and thus is not actually useful. Train test split provides a much better estimate of out of sample performance, and K fold cross validation does even better by systematically creating K train test splits and averaging the results together. However, train test split is still preferable to cross validation in many cases due to its speed and simplicity, and is what we will use in this video. You always need an evaluation metric to go along with your chosen procedure, and the choice of metric depends on the type of problem you're addressing. For aggression problems, we've used mean absolute error, mean squared error, and root mean squared error as our evaluation metrics. For classification problems, all we have used so far is classification accuracy. There are many other important evaluation metrics for classification, and those metrics are the focus of today's video. Before we learn any new evaluation metrics, let's review classification accuracy and talk about its strengths and weaknesses. I've chosen the Pima Indians Diabetes dataset for this lesson, which includes the health data and diabetes status of 768 patients. I'm going to load this data into a pandas data frame using the read CSV function and will explicitly specify the column names since the CSV file does not contain a header row. Let's print the first five rows from the data frame using the head method. Each row represents one patient, and the label column indicates one if the patient has diabetes, and zero if they do not have diabetes. We are defining the classification problem as follows. Can we predict the diabetes status of a patient given their health measurements. 
We're going to start by defining the feature matrix X and response vector Y. I'm going to choose pregnant, insulin, BMI, and age as the features. To create a pandas data frame containing only those four columns, I put the names of the columns in a Python list, pass that list to the Pima data frame using bracket notation, and store the result in X. To create Y, I use dot notation to select the pandas series named label. Now, let's quickly walk through the rest of the modeling process. We're using train test split to split X and Y into training and testing sets. We'll train a logistic regression model on the training set, which is a classification model despite its name. During the fit step, the log reg model object is learning the relationship between X train and Y train. Finally, we'll make class predictions for the testing set. We pass X test, the feature matrix for the testing set, to the predict method for the fitted model. This outputs a class prediction, one or zero, for every observation in the testing set which we'll store in an object called YPredClass. Now that we've made predictions for the testing set, we can calculate the classification accuracy, which is simply the percentage of correct predictions. We first import the metrics module from sklearn, and then pass YTest and YPredClass to the accuracy score function. Because YTest contains the true response values for the testing set, the accuracy score function can tell us what percentage of the predictions in YPred class were correct. The classification accuracy is 69%, which seems pretty good. However, anytime you use classification accuracy as your evaluation metric, it's important to compare it with null accuracy, which is the accuracy that could be achieved by always predicting the most frequent class in the testing set. Let's calculate null accuracy for this problem to see why this is a useful comparison. The Y test object is a pandas series object and so it has a value counts method that counts how many instances exist of each value in the series. In this case, the zero value is present 130 times, and the one value is present 62 times. This is known as the class distribution. Null accuracy answers the question, if my model was to predict the predominant class 100% of the time, how often would it be correct? Let's figure out how to calculate this. Because Y-test only contains ones and zeros, we can calculate the percentage of ones by simply taking the mean. In this case, 32% of the values in Y test are 1s. If you're confused as to why this calculation worked, pretend that you had a vector of 4 zeros and 6 1s, and I asked you what percentage of the values were 1s. The answer is obviously 60%, and you can arrive at that answer by totaling all of the values, which is 6, and dividing by the length of the vector, which is 10, which is equivalent to taking the mean of the vector. Anyway, since there are only two classes, we can calculate the percentage of zeros by taking 1 minus the mean of y test. <laughs>
The answer is 68%. And since 68 is larger than 32, we would say that 68% is the null accuracy for this problem. In other words, a dumb model that always predicts that a patient does not have diabetes will be right 68% of the time. This is obviously not a useful model, but it provides a baseline against which we might want to measure our logistic regression model. When we compare the null accuracy of 68% with the model accuracy of 69%, suddenly our model does not look very good. This demonstrates one weakness of classification accuracy as a model evaluation metric in that classification accuracy does not tell us anything about the underlying distribution of the testing set. Before we move on, I want to show you how to calculate null accuracy in a single line of code which is simply to take the max of y test mean and 1 minus y test mean. Note that this approach will only work for a binary classification problem in which the response value is coded as zeros and ones. For a problem with three or more classes, this is the code that I would use though it will only work if y test is a pandas series. Finally, I want to show you one other weakness of classification accuracy. Let's take a look at the first 25 true response values from y test, as well as the corresponding 25 predictions from our logistic regression model. Do you notice any patterns? You might have noticed that when the true response value is a zero, the model almost always correctly predicts a zero. But when the true response value is a one, the model rarely predicts a one. In other words, the model is usually making certain types of errors, but not others. But we would never know that simply by examining the accuracy. This particular issue will be addressed by the confusion matrix, which I'll discuss in the next section. To conclude this section, I'll briefly review what we've learned about classification accuracy. It is certainly a useful metric, in that it is the easiest metric to understand. However, accuracy does not tell you about the underlying distribution of response values, which we examined by calculating the null accuracy, nor does it tell you the types of errors your model is making, which is often useful to know in real-world situations. Let's now take a look at the confusion matrix, which I would loosely define as a table that describes the performance of a classification model. The confusion matrix function is also available in the metrics module, and in this case outputs a 2x2 two two NumPy array. The array is not labeled with any text, and so I've created a diagram to help explain the output. Before we discuss the diagram, I want to emphasize the importance, when using the confusion matrix function, of passing the true response values as the first argument and the predicted values as the second argument. If you pass these arguments in the opposite order, the confusion matrix will be reversed, but no error will be raised. All metrics functions in scikit-learn expect the true values to be the first argument, and so it's a good habit to adopt that pattern, even when the order doesn't technically matter 
for a particular function, such as accuracy score. Anyway, let's talk about what we can learn from the confusion matrix. You can think of it as a tally of the two types of correct predictions that the classifier can make, as well as a tally of the two types of incorrect predictions it can make. Thus, every observation in the testing set is represented in exactly one box of the confusion matrix. Sometimes, the confusion matrix will be explicitly labeled with the total number of observations represented, which is 192 in this case. The size is 2 by 2 because this is a binary classification problem. So if there were five possible response classes, this would be a 5 by 5 matrix. Also note that the format shown here is not universal in that sometimes the positions of the true and predicted values are reversed, and so it's critical that you pay attention to the particular format when interpreting a confusion matrix. When a confusion matrix is used for a binary problem, each of these four boxes has a specific name that is useful to memorize. The bottom right is called true positives and indicates that in 15 cases, the classifier correctly predicted that a patient has diabetes. The upper left is called true negatives and indicates that in 118 cases, the classifier correctly predicted that a patient does not have diabetes. The upper right is called false positives and indicates that in 12 cases, the classifier incorrectly predicted that a patient has diabetes when in fact they do not. The bottom left is called false negatives and indicates that in 47 cases, the classifier incorrectly predicted that a patient does not have diabetes when in fact they do have diabetes. There are a couple points I want to highlight before we move on. First, it's conventional to describe the class encoded as 1 as the positive class and to describe the class encoded as 0 as the negative class. That is why correctly predicting a 1 value is known as a true positive and correctly predicting a 0 value is known as a true negative. Second, if you have any trouble remembering the difference between a false positive and a false negative, just think of false positives as cases in which the classifier falsely predicted positive, and false negatives as cases in which it falsely predicted negative. Third, false positives are known in some fields as type 1 errors, and false negatives are known as type 2 errors. Finally, it's important to note that these four numbers are integer counts and are not rates. We'll talk shortly about some of the rates that can be calculated from a confusion matrix. I'm going to once again print out the first 25 true and predicted response values. Let's do a quick quiz to make sure that the terminology above is crystal clear. I want you to find examples of each of the four cases I described above. A true positive, a true negative, a false positive, and a false negative. Go ahead and pause the video and unpause it once you're done. Okay, so hopefully you were able to find examples of each of those. You can actually find examples right next to one another. Here's a true positive. Here's a true negative. Here's 
here's a false positive in which we falsely predicted a positive or a one and here's a false negative in which we falsely predicted a negative or a zero. Before we move on to the next section, I want to show you two things. First, I'm going to save the confusion matrix as an object called confusion and use NumPy's bracket notation to slice it into four individual pieces that I can use in the next section. Second, I've updated the diagram with the terms described above and added row and column totals, which will also be a useful reference during the next section. The confusion matrix is useful in helping you to understand the performance of your classifier, but how can it help you to choose between models? It's not a model evaluation metric, and so you can't simply tell scikit-learn to choose the model with the best confusion matrix. However, there are many metrics which can be calculated from a confusion matrix and those can be directly used to choose between models. Let's go through a few of the popular metrics and then at the end talk about how to choose which metric to optimize. As you may have already figured out, classification accuracy can be calculated from the confusion matrix. You add the true positives and true negatives and divide that by the total number of observations. In Python 2, you need one of the numbers to be a float so that it performs true division instead of integer division. As we've already seen, there's an accuracy score function in the metrics module which does the exact same thing. The next metric is classification error, also known as misclassification rate. It is equal to the false positives plus the false negatives divided by the total, or 1 minus the accuracy score. The next metric is sensitivity, which answers the question, when the actual value is positive, how often is the prediction correct? If we take a look at the sample of true and predicted responses, we know that the sensitivity is going to be low because in most cases when the actual value is 1, the model incorrectly predicts 0. Looking now at the confusion matrix, sensitivity is calculated by dividing the true positives by the total of the bottom row, or 15 divided by 62. The bottom row is all that is relevant for this calculation, since we're only considering cases in which the actual response value is 1. To me, the term sensitivity makes intuitive sense because it's a calculation of how sensitive the classifier is to detecting positive instances. However, it's also known by the terms true positive rate and recall, which may make more sense to you. Which of these terms is most commonly used is largely dependent on the field of study. Anyway, let's actually calculate sensitivity. Scikit-learn has a metrics function called recall score that can do this for us. <laughs> 
The next metric we'll discuss is specificity, which answers the question, when the actual value is negative, how often is the prediction correct? Just like sensitivity, specificity is something you want to maximize. Examining this sample once again, we know that the specificity will be high because in most cases when the actual value is zero, the model correctly predicts zero. In terms of the confusion matrix, specificity is calculated by dividing the true negatives by the total of the top row, or 118, divided by 130. This time, the top row is all that's relevant. If you want to memorize the term specificity, think of it as describing how specific or selective the classifier is in predicting positive instances. Anyway, there's currently no metrics function that can calculate specificity for us, and so we just have to calculate it manually. For both sensitivity and specificity, the best possible value is 1, and so you would describe our classifier as highly specific but not highly sensitive. Let's move on to false positive rate. It answers the question, when the actual value is negative, how often is the prediction incorrect? Just like specificity, only the top row of the confusion matrix is relevant to this calculation, except this time it's the false positives divided by the total of the top row. As you might have figured out already, false positive rate is simply 1 minus specificity, which is how I remember it. Finally, let's calculate precision. It answers the question, when a positive value is predicted, how often is the prediction correct? This is our first metric in which the denominator is a column instead of a row, and is calculated by dividing true positives by the total of the right column, or 15 divided by 27. You can think of precision as describing how precise the classifier is when predicting a positive instance. Anyway, precision can be calculated using the metrics function precision score. Note that many other metrics can be calculated from the confusion matrix, such as the F1 score and Matthews correlation coefficient. To conclude this section, I want to advise you that you should always examine the confusion matrix for your classifier since it gives you a more complete picture of how your classifier is performing. It also allows you to compute various classification metrics which can guide your model selection process. However, you can't optimize your model for every one of these metrics, so how do you choose between them? The choice of metric ultimately depends on your business objective, and the easiest way for me to explain this is through two examples. In the first example, we're building a spam filter in which an observation represents an email, and the positive class is spam. In this case, most people would say that false negatives, in which spam goes to the inbox, are more acceptable than false positives in which non-spam is caught by the spam filter. Thus, 
our priority is to minimize false positives, and so we might choose to optimize our model for precision or specificity. Our second example is a fraudulent transaction detector for a website in which an observation represents a transaction and the positive class is fraud. In this case, the website owner might judge that false positives, in which normal transactions are flagged as possible fraud, are more acceptable than false negatives, in which fraudulent transactions are missed, since the former can often be resolved without losing a sale, while the latter likely results in the loss of money. Thus, our priority is to minimize false negatives, and so we might choose to optimize our model for sensitivity. Hopefully, this has given you a useful framework for thinking about your own machine learning problem. I'd love to hear from you in the comments section about the classification problem you're trying to solve and what metric you're planning to focus on. We're now going to discuss how to modify the performance of a classifier by adjusting the classification threshold, a term which I'll define momentarily. You'll see in a few minutes how this topic relates to the evaluation metrics above. Let's take a look at the first 10 predicted response values by passing xTest to the predict method for the logistic regression model and then slicing out the first 10 results. It's a one-dimensional array of zeros and ones, just like you would expect. There's a similar method for classification models called predict proba, which outputs predicted probabilities of class membership. What does that mean? Let's take a look at the first 10 predicted probabilities to find out. Pause the video for a moment while you examine the output and unpause it once you've come to a conclusion. It turns out that each row represents one observation and each column represents a particular class. There are two columns because there are two possible response classes, 0 and 1. The column on the left, known as column 0, shows us the predicted probability that each observation is a member of class 0. The column on the right, known as column 1, shows us the predicted probability that each observation is a member of class 1. For each row, these numbers add up to 1. Where do these numbers come from? Explaining how logistic regression works is beyond the scope of this video, but basically the model learns a coefficient for each input feature during the model training process, and those coefficients are used to calculate the likelihood of each class for each observation in the test set. Why might we care about these predicted probabilities? Since this model predicts the likelihood of diabetes, we might rank observations by predicted probability of diabetes and prioritize our patient preventative outreach accordingly, since it makes more sense to contact someone with a 95% chance of diabetes than a 55% chance. Anyway, it turns out that when you run the predict method for a classification model, it first predicts the probabilities for each class and then chooses the class with the highest probability as the predicted response. For a binary problem like this one, another way of thinking about it is that there is a 0.5 classification threshold and class 1 is predicted only if that threshold is exceeded, otherwise class 0 is predicted. 
as you can see, there are only two instances shown in which the probability of class 1 exceeds 0 0.5. And those are the instances in which class 1 is predicted. Let's now isolate the predicted probabilities for class 1, since knowing that alone enables you to calculate the predicted probability for both classes. I use slicing notation here to tell NumPy that I wanted rows 0 through 9 of the array but that I wanted all columns of the array represented by the colon. If I just want column 1, I simply replace the colon with the number 1. We'll store these predicted probabilities in an object called ypredprob. To distinguish them, from the predicted classes that I stored in the ypred class object. And of course, we want the predicted probabilities for all testing set observations, not just the first 10. And so we replace the 0 through 10 with a colon. We're now going to plot a histogram of these probabilities to help demonstrate how adjusting the classification threshold can impact the performance of the model. First, I need to allow plots to appear in the notebook, and I'm also overriding one of the default matplotlib settings. We'll use matplotlib to plot a histogram of the predicted probabilities of class 1. A histogram shows you the distribution of a numerical variable. We can see by the height of this third bar, for example, that about 45 of the observations had values between 0.2 and 0.3. Given the 0.5 classification threshold that I mentioned earlier, we can see from the histogram that class 1 is rarely predicted since only a small minority of the testing set observations had a predicted probability above the threshold. Think for a moment about what might happen if we were to change the threshold to a number other than 0.5. It turns out that you can adjust both the sensitivity and specificity of a classifier simply by adjusting the threshold. For example, if we decrease the threshold for predicting diabetes, say to 0.3, we can increase the sensitivity of the classifier. That is like shifting the threshold bar from here to here, such that all the observations with predicted probabilities above 0.3 are now predicted as class 1. This increases sensitivity because the classifier is now more sensitive to positive instances. If this is confusing, the example of a metal detector might be helpful. It is essentially a classifier which predicts metal, yes or no, and a threshold is set so that large metal objects set off the detector, but tiny ones do not. How would you increase the sensitivity of a metal detector? You would simply lower the threshold amount of metal that is required to set it off and thus it is now more sensitive to metal and will predict yes more often. Anyway, let's now lower the threshold for predicting diabetes. We can pass ypredprob and the threshold value of 0.3 to the binarize function 
from sklearn.preprocessing. It will return a 1 for all values above 0.3 and a 0 otherwise. The results are in a two-dimensional NumPy array, and so we just slice out the first dimension using the bracket notation and save the results in the ypred class object. Let's check that it worked. We'll print the first 10 predicted probabilities and then the first 10 predicted classes using the lower threshold. You can see that there are now five instances in which class one is predicted. To see the impact of this change across the entire testing set, we can print the previous confusion matrix stored in the confusion object, as well as the new confusion matrix generated by the confusion matrix function. The row totals have not changed since the rows represent the actual response values. So there are still 130 observations in the top row and 62 observations in the bottom row. But the column totals have changed because a lot of the class zero predictions have moved to class one. You can imagine observations from the left column moving to the right column. We can recalculate sensitivity, which has increased from 0.24 to 0.74, as well as specificity, which has decreased from 0.91 to 0.62. Why did specificity decrease? Since observations moved from the left column to the right column, that guarantees that the number of false positives will increase and true negatives will decrease, which decreases specificity. As we've seen above, a threshold of 0.5 is used by default to convert predicted probabilities into class predictions. However, you don't have to accept the default threshold and can manually lower it to increase sensitivity or raise it to increase specificity depending on your business objective. However, sensitivity and specificity have an inverse relationship, so increasing one will always decrease the other. Keep in mind that adjusting the threshold is one of the last steps you should take in the model building process. The majority of your time should be focused on building better models and then selecting the best possible model. During the previous section, you might have been thinking that it seems incredibly inefficient to search for an optimal threshold by trying different threshold values one at a time. Wouldn't it be nice then if we could see how sensitivity and specificity are affected by various thresholds without actually having to try each threshold? It turns out that there is a very simple mechanism for doing this, namely by plotting the ROC curve. Let's take a look at the ROC curve. First, you run the ROC curve function from scikit-learn's metrics module. You pass it the true values for the testing set, stored in Ytest, and the predicted probability of class 1 for each observation, stored in ypredprob. It is critically important that you use ypredprob and not ypred class when creating the ROC curve, because using ypred class will give you incorrect results without generating an error. Anyway, the ROC curve function returns three objects, 
and the next seven lines of code simply creates a line plot with the appropriate limits, labels, and so on. The ROC curve is a plot of the true positive rate on the y-axis against the false positive rate on the x-axis for all possible classification thresholds. To use the terminology I've been focusing on, the y-axis is sensitivity and the x-axis is 1 minus specificity. This plot tells you, for example, that if you want to achieve a sensitivity of 0.9, you have to be willing to accept a specificity of around 0.4. The optimal ROC curve hugs the upper left corner of the plot since that would represent a classifier with both high sensitivity and high specificity. In summary, the ROC curve can help you to visually choose a threshold that balances sensitivity and specificity in a way that makes sense for your problem. Unfortunately, you can't actually see the thresholds used to generate the ROC curve on the curve itself. However, I've written a small helper function called evaluate threshold that allows you to pass in a threshold value and see the resulting sensitivity and specificity. When I pass in the value 0 0.5, I see our original sensitivity and specificity of 0.24 and 0.91. That threshold generated the point right here on the ROC curve. When I pass in the value 0 0.3, I see our modified sensitivity and specificity of 0.74 and 0.62, which can be found here. Again, the ROC curve is simply a plot of sensitivity versus 1 minus specificity for all possible classification thresholds from 0 to 1. Anyway, given a particular point on the ROC curve, it would be a simple trial and error process to locate the threshold that produced that point. Before we wrap up this video, there's one other term that I want to introduce, which is area under the curve, also known as AUC. AUC is quite literally the area under the ROC curve, meaning the percentage of this box that is located under this curve. Because an ideal classifier would hug the upper left corner of this plot, a higher AUC value is indicative of a better overall classifier. As such, AUC is often used as a single number summary of the performance of a classifier as an alternative to classification accuracy. We can calculate the AUC for our model using the ROC AUC score function from the metrics module. Once again, it's important that we pass it the true response values and then the predicted probabilities, not the predicted classes. Our AUC is 0.72, whereas the best possible AUC for any classifier is 1. It turns out that AUC can also be interpreted as follows. If you randomly chose one positive observation and one negative observation from your testing set, 
AUC represents the likelihood that your classifier will assign a higher predicted probability to the positive observation. It makes sense that this is a useful goal because ultimately we want the classifier to rank positive observations higher than negative observations in terms of predicted probability. Finally, it's worth noting that AUC is a useful evaluation metric even when there is high class imbalance, meaning that one of the classes dominates. If we were detecting fraudulent transactions, for example, we would expect that the vast majority of transactions would not be fraudulent, and thus the null accuracy would be well above 99%. In this scenario, AUC would be a useful evaluation metric, whereas classification accuracy would not. Anyway, because AUC is useful as a metric for choosing between models, it is available as a scoring function for cross-val score, as you can see here. In this video, we've discussed many ways to evaluate a classifier. The confusion matrix and the ROC curve are tools that describe how your classifier is performing, and I would suggest that you use both of them whenever possible. The main advantage of the confusion matrix is that many evaluation metrics can be calculated from it, and you can focus on the metrics that match your business objectives. As well, it extends easily to multi-class problems in which there are more than two response classes. The main advantage of ROC curves and AUC is that they do not require you to choose a classification threshold, unlike the confusion matrix. As well, they are useful even when there is high class imbalance. However, they are less interpretable than the confusion matrix for multi-class problems. I've got many great resources related to today's video, so I'll highlight a few. First is my blog post on confusion matrix terminology that may be useful to you as a reference guide. That is followed by two excellent videos from Rahul Patwari which I highly recommend if you'd like to get a better understanding of sensitivity and specificity. And Ed Potagil, a fellow data science instructor, has put together a great notebook explaining how to calculate expected value from a confusion matrix. For a better understanding of ROC curves, I'd first recommend that you read these excellent lesson notes from the University of Georgia, which contain lots of real life examples. As well, check out my 14 minute video explaining the ROC curve in more depth using a nice interactive visualization. If you want even more depth, the paper on ROC analysis by Tom Fawcett is highly readable. As usual, Scikit-Learn has excellent documentation for learning more about model evaluation. I recently created a guide comparing different model evaluation procedures and metrics that summarizes a lot of what we've learned in this video series. And finally, if you want to learn about sophisticated model evaluation in the real world, check out this excellent video about how Stripe evaluates its fraud detection model. At least for now, this is actually going to be my final video in the Scikit-Learn video series. I want to thank you so much for joining me throughout the series, and also thanks for all your kind comments. If you'd like to join one of my live online courses in which I cover data science topics in more depth, please visit dataschool.io learn. Thanks again, and hope to see you soon.